he's always just given everything a go. My dad, he can do, he can do anything. And you can see it in our family, you know, my brother, my sister and I, we all, we travel, we do stuff and we live our life. He's the guy that all his friends would go to. Uh, he's always been really helpful. His whole life's been about that. It's never been about him. It's always just been about what he can do for other people. You don't ever think that you're um, your big, strong dad who's always been capable of doing everything and lifting himself up would just get, things would take over. I was living and working in Ballarat. I'd been in Newcastle, yeah, for a few years before that. I mean, I was going well there and just a normal day's work and I'd finished and I walked outside and got in the car and I could hear this really high-pitched sort of screaming sound. <laughs> Turned out I had tinnitus, which is a, a ringing in your, in your ear. A certain percentage of people don't cope with it and I was that small percentage. I just couldn't cope with the sound. It took a while for Dad to start saying stuff and he would say things, but I don't think I really realised how bad it was. And he had to sort of quit work for a while and then he went back to it and then he had another blackout and it led to other things like obviously anxiety and, you know, and then depression and just goes, oh no, it's just something, it'll go, it'll go, it'll go and it didn't and... Then I isolated myself. I didn't want to tell anyone what the problem was. With that goes um, embarrassment, guilt, and the more you do that, the more, the more you retreat, you, you just implode, it just keeps caving in on you. And then my family said, Mark, you just need to head back up north. So I just virtually gave everything away that I had. I sold my furniture to my neighbours and friends for next to nothing, just packed everything up. And I thought, well, you know, I'm just leaving all these great friends. And I just left because of the embarrassment. I've got three kids and the first person I saw was my son, Kel. He's the youngest. And I told him I was gonna arrive at his house. He drove from Ballarat to my place in Balmain. He couldn't even get out of the car. He drove for 11 hours straight, stopping for fuel. Just couldn't get out. I had to ring him. He was 50 metres away in the house. Dad was just broken down in the front seat of his car. That's when everything really got bad. That was the worst I've ever seen him. It's horrible. Just, and then when we went inside and talked about you know, certain things that, that, that was the hardest thing for me, you know, it's, um, I never thought I'd have conversations like that with my old man and, and just, you know, talking about suicide. He was living in Newcastle and he started to think that it would be easier to live in somewhere like Tasmania after visiting it and seeing how beautiful it was. It's, it's the most fantastic environment. It just makes me take a breath. And taking financial pressures off him so that he could focus on getting better. I got down here in November last year. I went off my medication, much to the um, protestations of my doctor. And he called me and, and he was ecstatic. He was like, I'm so happy I'm here, I feel so good. And I got here to this, this, this little house. Um, it's on five acres. It's secluded. I was stoked. I just thought, cool, like, this is going to be the, the thing that helps Dad um, get back to his strong self. But I think I was only here for, I think, four days. I just had a huge panic attack in my bedroom, waking up in the morning and, and purging and dry reaching and crying and screaming and, and shaking and being terrified for no reason. Just massive, out of nowhere. He didn't call me and tell me. His friend Beck, who was there, called my uncle Chris and said, I think, you know, I think Mark's really, really having a hard time. So next minute I've got my brother and two of my kids here and what they witnessed was just 
you know, I still feel a bit, it makes me a bit teary thinking about it. Bon and I were there for a few days and we were just trying to, to deal with it, trying to work out you know what, what to do. We went to we went to hospital. We went to doctors. And I remember Kate, like here's me, 63 years of age, and a 33 year old daughter's getting into bed next to me and cuddling me. I mean, that's pretty amazing. It was pretty. It's pretty weird to see your big strong dad like that. And the same thing. Then the guilt kicks in again that you're putting your kids through this. They saw me naked. They saw me vomiting. <laughs> they saw me. You know, they saw me at my worst. And I got him and I said, look at me. And he said, no, I said, look at me. He said, no, I'm not, I'm not gonna look at you. And he said, I just, I don't want you to see me like this. He said, a, a daughter shouldn't see their dad like this. You know, it's, I should be looking after you. Dad goes above and beyond for anyone and everyone, so, so now I guess it's our turn to repay the favour. Instead of having um, thoughts about, oh, look, I'll go to New York tomorrow, I'll plan a trip, I'll go on SCR ride, I'll do this, all those thoughts are gone because the only thoughts you've got are thoughts of survival and thoughts of what you've got to get, go through the next day. Am I going to get better? Am I going mad? Will this last forever? So you're trying to cope with all this and the body doesn't function. You don't eat, you don't sleep. Everything changes, totally. And these constant thoughts going through your head just on repetition. Within a couple of days, the anxiety hit me again. I was, my mind was telling me that I had to go back. And luckily, the friends that I'd made down here I had shared with them how I, what had happened. Yeah, he's really surrounding himself with some people and it's, it's making a big difference. I just, it was just a decision I made within myself. I didn't read it anywhere, no one told me to do it. I just thought it was a lot easier to be upfront about it. And then I suppose then people can sort of see what's happening. Not that they can understand it, but, and you feel comfortable in yourself. I just tell them straight. A mental illness got me here. And I go, what do you mean? And I just tell them. It's a release. Talking about it is what makes it better and no, no reason to go through it by yourself. So that type of conversation can really help him and other people heal. It's better than any medicine. It's, you, you relax, they empathise. So once you tell people, I think it's a great thing. Those little bits of love that people give you can really, you know, lift you up. So it's, it's good that he's, he's got some people doing that to him. It's, it's so important. It might not help you get well any quicker, but it's great to know that people are there for you if you really, really need them. And that's why I think the DGR message is such a great one because what a community that is. Tens of thousands of people, whether they're male or female, or whether they can build a bike or not, everyone is accepted, you know? Mental illness needs to be accepted. And once that acceptance is, um, is given, the person who has the mental illness don't feel like they have to hide away, like I used to do and isolate yourself because that's the worst thing you can do. If you're a motorcycle enthusiast, it's one of the best things you can experience to see all those bikes, hear them all start up, everyone's dressed up, everyone's just feeling so good. But amongst those couple of those thousand or so people, there could be someone who's really struggling that they don't know that, you know. So maybe they could just but just before they leave, they just look at the guy next to them and say, well how are you going? If you're really asking someone that and letting them know that you're, you care about them and that you're there for them, it can really strike something in someone. The more and more we do it all together, then, then we will be there for other people. And I think it's really important for everyone to do that with their friends, 
their family and to just let them know that it's okay to tell people that you're having a hard time and people who love you want to help. I don't know, maybe just hug someone. You know, feel their emotion in them. It's a bit hard to hug on a bike though. But <laughs> I think it just, the conversation needs to be had. I'm here for you. <laughs> I'm here for you. I'm here for you. I'm here for you. I'm here for you. We're here for you. I love you, Dad. I'm here for you, Dad. Always. Like you were for me. <laughs>